Okay, good evening to you. Once again, we are here, and this is a privilege to do this. I have my phone with me, in front of me, as does Russell. Uh, this is the best we can do for now regarding Bible study. I said last week, as I shared uh, the last chapter, which was the goodness of God, I made a statement, and I made the same statement, that this is, in reality, isn't fellowship. This is not the best means that we can have. This is trying to do our best in an awful situation. You know, we, and I'm sure, and I hope those of you who, who have took the time to join us tonight, are inwardly craving to be once again in the house of God, with the saints, worshipping God and seeking his face. So, though by God's goodness to us and his mercy towards us, we have over the last three months, it is now, been able to communicate the gospel, uh, such things as the attributes of God, and as you might know, if you're aware, if you belong to us, we have uh, put our Sunday evenings back on, and we're communicating in the best way we know how, but particularly, and especially, no doubt, from where you're sitting, that this is not ideal by any means. We cannot do the things that we're encouraged to do, to break bread together. We cannot do the things that we're encouraged to do, to greet one another with a holy kiss, and to pray together. And those things I feel uh, tonight that, that we are, and I certainly am, and I know Russell is, and others, are longing to see return. And um, sooner or later, uh, I trust that we will be at that place. Today we move on to the patience of God. Uh, the patience of God um, is something that is quite remarkable, as we probably say week in, week out. As we study these attributes, there is the... A wonder of them and we were just talking before we came on air the necessity to do these things at the moment this is very topical and uh, subjective we are breaking down uh, certain doctrines to look at them so here at Jacksdale Southside Community Church we have a real fundamental and basic understanding of who God is and then out of the scriptures and out of the stories that we read we will begin to think even our own private reading whether it's through the gospels whether it's through the prophets whether it's through the law whether it's through the epistles, what we will, should be seeing now is the, the goodness, the patience, the sovereignty, the, the, the mercy of God. All, all these things as we read through the Bible we should be seeing. And that is the purpose of these studies. So that we have a fundamental, basic understanding that we can grow in the knowledge of the God to whom we profess to know and love. So I'm going to pray. Of course, I'm going to encourage you, as you already are, good evening to all. Um, make comment, whether that be a question, whether that be a statement, whether that be a scripture that is applicable to the subject that we're looking at. So, good to see you all. Share the video. Encourage people to be on. This is, this is a great subject to be looking at, the patience of God. And I can speak from a personal point of view. When we speak about patience, we all, in one way, shape or form, lack but as we're going to read tonight, God does not lack in any good thing. Those of you who are joining, please, if you will, bow your head and let us speak to God. Father, with all our faults, we come to you. With all our weaknesses, we approach you. But we approach you in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, knowing that we can boldly come to the eternal throne of grace. Father, that it is your work. I heard a quote the other day by R.C. Sproul. He said, the gospel is a gospel of works. And it took the congregation back. But not our works, but of the complete work of Jesus Christ, to which we approach you on. Not our works, not our deeds, not our efforts, but on the great work of Christ, the completion of the law, the, the doing of the law, the fulfilling of the law, the perfection of all that he is and all that he did and then dying as one who was a criminal father we come to you in the name of jesus your son to whom came and died and rose again in order to save sinners it is that name to which we say abba father it is that name to which we long to come to that place which you have promised you preparing for us it is that name to which we have hope of the seal of the spirit it is that name which is higher than any other it is that name which is the only name under heaven to which man can be saved and Lord, we approach you in that. We come to you, O oh Father, 
our Father in heaven, in that wonderful name. And tonight, Lord, as we read the pages of your word, as we look to the teaching of the attributes of God and the patience of God, may it be overflowing with Christ-likeness. May we approach it, approach it in that way. May we be willing to learn in that way. May we seek to grow in the knowledge of Christ, that we might be good for one another, that we might be good for the kingdom of God, that we might be good for the church, and in the end that we might be prepared better to bring you all the glory and all the worship that is due your holy name. Father, tonight remember the weak. Father, whether that be uh, physically, whether that be in ailments, whether that be in strength, Father, for, for those amongst us, I ask, Lord, for those who are still in that feeling of being vulnerable, I ask, Lord, for those who may not be in full health, I ask you, Lord, that you'll touch them and they'll know that you're ever with them. Father, I ask tonight for those who are strong, that they will realise if there is any strength in them, it is only because they are built on the firm foundations of the rock, which of course is Christ. Father, tonight, of those amongst us, I ask of those who may be ignorant, ignorant of the truth, unknowingly seeing the darkness to where they belong. Father, if there is any amongst us, anyone listening, who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour, that you'll pierce their hearts, Lord. And it would not be just a claim to know Jesus, but it would be an, an absolute assurance of knowing him. So, Father, I pray tonight for the, for the lost. I pray tonight for those who are downcast, that they might come to you and call upon you. And your promise is, if we call upon the name of Jesus Christ, that we shall be saved. Grant salvation to our households tonight, Lord. Grant salvation amongst this congregation. Grant salvation to those around us who we love and long to come into your kingdom. And Lord, I ask as we grow in your grace, that we too, as we come to our subject, would grow in patience. That we might be more Christ-like. For that is why we come to study tonight. Not to have big heads, but to have hearts moulded and shaped that we might go on and edify only the saints and worship God of heaven and earth in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Over to you, Russell. Okay, can you find Psalm 86, 15 then, while we read this first paragraph? I'm gonna, I've got the other two turned up, but two, three scriptures will just um, flick through. They'll probably all consist of the same thing anyway, but it's better to look at them. Always better to read the scriptures rather than assume we know what they say. I just want to say before I begin reading, um, that Ryan's already praying, but we don't want to be a people who just look at these things so that we can gain more intelligence in the subjects we're looking at. It is, of course, the way that God does um, penetrate our hearts, first and foremost, is through our minds. We do need to get our minds upon uh, the, the doctrines of God, the teachings, the, the scriptures. We need them in our minds, but the intention is that they will be transforming in our hearts and that we may have hearts of flesh rather than hearts of stone and we don't want to be people who as Paul said I think in 1 Corinthians 8 people who are puffed up with knowledge yeah so please do know that what we're doing here is not about making intellectual minds but godly hearts and lives that's what we do pray and hope that God will do so let's let's press on into this chapter this is chapter 12 of the book the patience of God and I'm going to start then from the beginning. Far less has been written upon this than the other excellencies of the divine character. Not a few of those who have expatiated at length upon the divine attributes have passed over the patience of God without any comment. It is not easy to suggest a reason for this, for surely the patience of God is as much one of the divine perfections as his wisdom, power, or holiness, and as much to be admired and revered by us. True, the actual term will not be found in a concordance as frequently as the others, but the glory of this grace itself shines forth on almost every page of Scripture. Certain it is that we lose much if we do not frequently meditate upon the patience of God and earnestly pray that our hearts and ways 
may be more completely conformed thereto. Most probably, the principal reason why so many writers have failed to give us anything separately upon the patience of God was because of the difficulty of distinguishing this attribute from the divine goodness and mercy, particularly the latter. God's patience is mentioned in conjunction with his grace and mercy again and again, as may be seen by consulting Exodus 34, 6, Numbers 14, 18, Psalm 86, verse 15. So let's just have a quick look at these verses. So Exodus 34, verse 6, says these words, And the Lord passed by before him. This is speaking of the time where Moses had cried out for uh, God to show him his glory and he put him in the cleft of the rock. It says, The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. The, the word long-suffering is the one that we're looking at. Numbers 14, verse 18 the Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Again, the point there being long-suffering in the same context as mercy. And again in Psalm 86, verse 15. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion, gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and in truth. That the patience of God is rarely a display of his mercy, that it is indeed one way in which it is frequently manifested, cannot be denied. But that patience and mercy are one and the same excellency and are not to be separated, we cannot conceive. It may not be easy to discriminate between them. Nevertheless, Scripture fully warrants us in affirming some things about the one which we cannot about the other. Stephen Charnock, the Puritan, defines God's patience in part thus. It is part of the divine goodness and mercy, yet differs from both. God being the greatest goodness has the greatest mildness. Mildness is always the companion of true goodness. And the greater the goodness, the greater the mildness. Who so holy as Christ? And who so meek? God's slowness to anger is a branch from his mercy. The Lord is full of compassion, slow to anger, we read in Psalm 145, verse 8. It differs from mercy in the formal consideration of the object. Listen to this next, these next few words. Mercy respects the creature as miserable. It's an interesting statement. Mercy respects the creature as miserable. Patience respects the creature as criminal. Mercy pities him in his misery. And patience bears with the sin which engendered the misery and is giving birth to more. So patience is God bearing with that sin from which the mercy that he has has already rendered pity towards him. Personally we would define the divine patience as that power of control which God exercises over himself. I think this is really interesting. I've never thought about it like this before when I read this. When you think about the patience of God, of course you usually go to the words such as long-suffering. And think about, as he goes on later on to say, about that patience that God has had particularly with you. I think the way to really identify the patience of God is, is best within your own life, knowing your own sin, knowing your own wickedness, knowing that scripture that says the heart is deceitfully wicked and we know our own selves. And yet we know that God knows us infinitely greater than we even know ourselves. But to know 
uh, the times and the issues that we have both fallen into, the sin of our hearts and minds. I don't know about you, but I have thought about myself before and thought, why God have you not struck me down before now? And thought about the patience that he has with me. So with that, that patience towards us ourselves, I think, is a real first place for us to see. So it says, personally, we would defy, defy the divine patience as that power of control which God exercises over himself, causing him to bear with the wicked and forbear so long in punishing them. In Nahum 1 verse 3, we read, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. Upon which Mr. Charnock said, Men that are great in the world are quick in passion and are not so ready to forgive an injury or bear with an offender as one of a lower rank. It is a lack of power over that man's self that makes him do unbecoming things upon a provocation. So we have this um, revenge type attitude. We want to, if someone offends us, straight away we want to defend ourselves, straight away we want to make them take their words back or something. You know, we want them to, to show that they're wrong, to, to do what they did in front of everybody publicly. And, and sometimes it's right for that to be done. But I'm, I'm talking more about the attitude that we can have. That we, we must have that retribution straight away where it says here that although God in his anger, although God in his, in his kind of wrath and his thoughts towards sin, he actually uh, forbears or holds back his judgment upon sin, whereas we would always want to punish it straight away. A prince, it says here, a prince that can bridle his passions, this is great, this is, a prince that can bridle his passion is a king over himself as well as over his subjects. God is slow to anger because great in power. He has no less power over himself than over his creatures. I think that's, I think that's great. I really do. I really do think that's a great thing to ponder upon. That actually he has power over himself. No less than he has power over his creatures when it comes to this issue. It is at the above point, we think, that God's patience is most clearly distinguished from his mercy. Though the creature is benefited thereby, the patience of God chiefly respects himself. How many of us have actually thought that? That, you know, when we, when we think about the patience of God, again, as I said before, we think about how he's had patience upon us personally. And that's true, but actually, to think about it, E.W. Pink here is saying that the patience of God does benefit us, but actually it chiefly respects himself. The restraint placed upon his acts by his will, whereas his mercy terminates wholly upon the creature. So there's a bit of a distinction between patience and mercy. The patience is respecting himself in restraining his wrath, in holding back his acts, according to his own will. Mercy is all about what he floods upon his people as a whole. The patience of God is that excellency which causes him to sustain great injuries without immediately avenging himself. He has a power of patience as well as a power of justice. Thus, the Hebrew word for the divine patience or long-suffering is rendered slow to anger. In Nehemiah 9.17, excuse me, and Psalm 103, verse 8. So let's have a look at them. Which one are you going for? Uh, I'll go for Psalm 103, because I'm in the Psalms now. So you can find Nehemiah. Nehemiah 9, aren't we? So Nehemiah 9.17 says... I'll read, I'll read, what was it, sorry, 17. Yeah. I'll read 16 as well. But they, they and their, our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks, and hearkened not to thy commandments, and refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among, among them. 
but hardened their necks in their rebellion, appointed a captain to return to their bondage. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and forsookest them not. Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. There has to be a reason why he is this. So, I think in Romans, I'm thinking out loud here, it talks about he, was, he looked over sin for a while. So all this, and I'm sure we'll come to this, all this is determined and placed upon the atoning work of Jesus Christ. That, that is why he can offer his mercy and his patience, because inevitably, and I'm, I'm sure we'll touch this when we get to the attribute, the wrath of God, Justice has to be uh, appeased, justice has to be done, but in his patience, he can offer us mercy because of, he has now a, has, has provided us with redemption in Jesus Christ. He can't, he's just not, he isn't going to be forever patient. No. I think that has to be understood. Well, he, says, he says, doesn't it, man, you yeah. will not strive with man forever. Yeah, man will not, yeah, God will not strive with man forever. So, though, you know, I'm thinking, and please comment, that th there's an object, Jesus Christ, who, who has caused this to be about. There was, a, there was always a demand of a sacrifice. There was always a demand to, for sin to be covered, to sin to be dealt with. Um, and, the, and even in the Old Testament, the shadow of the sacrifice, which was the coming Christ, allowed God, if you like, to be patient. Because atonement was going to take place. I think it, it goes on in this chapter somewhere uh, towards the end, I think, about his people. About how it bears upon his people. Yeah, patience towards it talks about. We'll read that when we get to the, to the end. It, it does talk about how it all bears down on his people. Yeah. And uh, even, even really, if you think about his patience toward the ungodly, as I think we're going to read in a minute, that all is still to do with God's purpose in his people. That he doesn't judge the wicked straight away. Yeah. But he would, he, if he wanted to wipe, if, you know, th think about the day that we live in. The absolute rejection and hatred towards God. God, yeah, is still offering up his patience. Yeah. He is still being patient. And that needs to be underlined. That is not because God is sitting in heaven hoping some might come to him. He is patient because he planned and purposed all this to come about in, in all of his, in his good times. And, and his patience won't, uh, it'll never cease, but it cease as we know it, is when that uh, the last Gentile comes in. And this is all oppo as opposed to our supposed patience. Well, the, the problem is, Russell, um, again, as we've talked a lot about today, we have a gospel that would, would if, if, if the contemporary view of the gospel was speaking about the patience of God, they, they would probably emphasise that God is patient so that, that you would respond. Yeah. And that's what this is, this is not giving about, you a chance. You know, he's yeah. patient in giving you a chance. He's not. Yeah. He's patient. He's patient in, in, in outworking his, his will, his will yes. and his plan from, because he is the Alpha and the Omega. And I think, you know, we've got to be careful that we don't fall into that well, God is patient. You know, I, I'm, I'm patient with my kids to a degree. And I'm not, God is not patient with us like that, like hoping, hoping, hoping. Yeah. Patient hope isn't hope we'll patient. Patient, patience isn't hope. No, he says that. He says that, actually, where I was just looking. Does it? Yeah. It brings about hope. Let's just carry on and yeah. see where it takes us. So it says, basically, the, uh, the Hebrew word... Translated from patience in long suffering is rendered slow to anger, so he is slow to anger. Not that there are any passions in the divine nature, but that God's wisdom and will is pleased to act with that stateliness and sobriety which is becoming to his exalted majesty. Which is why we, when we, we always want retribution straight away, that's because we don't have this, we don't have that stateliness, that sobriety. That exalted majesty. We, we, would, we would want to punish people and get our vengeance on somebody who has really hurt us straight away if we could. 
but that's a, a real human attribute that God holds back for his own will. In support of our definition above, let us point out that it was to this excellency and the divine character that Moses appealed when Israel sinned so grievously at Kadesh Barnea and there provoked Jehovah so sorely. Unto his servant the Lord said, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them. Then it was that, that mediator Moses, as a type of Christ to come, pleaded, I beseech you, let the power of my Lord be great, according as you have spoken, saying the Lord is patient. That's Numbers 14, verse 17. Thus, Pink says, his patience is his power of self-restraint. Again, you look at our power, our patience, it would never work out like this. Let, let's just think about this for a minute. You know, you talk about the story there where Moses, and it's not only in this story, time and time again, he comes and he intercedes for the nation. Yeah? He intercedes for the nation of Israel. Now, God used that situation, or that person, Moses, to display his patience. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. He used Moses to as a as a uh, as an as vehicle, a as a tool to display his patience. Yeah. It wasn't that Moses convinced him to be patient. Does no. that make yeah, any yeah. sense? Yeah. Yeah. Just thinking out loud here. It's, it, all, it's all good all. because we do have this tendency to think that we can twist God's arm. I will show my patience, in a sense, as, well, as I read this and I'm reading it right. I'll show my patience, and in my patience, I am going to give you a mediator, the man Moses. Yeah. He gives. He always gives the right way of displaying to us his graces, and in this, in the in the story of Moses, he displayed his patience to us by giving us a, or giving the people of Israel a mediator, which of course is a shadow or a type of Christ. So he can display his patience to us because he's been fully satisfied in the work of Christ. The Father, that is. Amen. We're going on to Romans 9.22 and it says, What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Were God to immediately break these reprobate vessels into pieces, his power of self-control would not so eminently appear. By bearing with their wickedness and forbearing punishment so long, the power of his patience is gloriously demonstrated. True, the wicked interpret his patience quite differently, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. That's Ecclesiastes 8 verse 11. Let me just read that again. Because sentence against an evil work is not ex executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. I think there is something else said in one of the parables in the Gospels. I think it's, it's when people cry out and say, where is this God? How long is he staying away? Kind of thing. Mm. Like, and, 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 and then because this, this person, this king, or however it explains this person that's gone away, has gone away so long, they start to be rough with the servants. And in a way, in a sense, you see it exactly with what happened with the Israelites and the golden yeah. calf. Yeah. Where is this Moses? You know, where is this Moses? It's gone away. So like this here, if, if, if people think they've got away with something, if they've done something wrong and, and there's no punishment come, there's no retribution come, and you think you've got away with it from a wicked heart, actually, is it says here, it, it sets, it fully sets them to do evil. So they can think actually, or we could think, if we're in that frame of mind, we've got away with it, let's carry on. Yeah. Let, let's go and do more. Let's, you know, you get more broader in your confidence that, that there's no punishment coming. Yeah. Where is God? Where is this God you keep preaching about? You know, you, you were speaking about the other day about why do the righteous fare so well? Yeah. Yet one day, the, their life, like the, like the green grass, will be um, singed and burnt up like it was, like it was 
never there. Yeah, like it was in the hot sun. So, let's carry on. That was Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11. It says, But the anointed eye adores what they have used. The patience of God, oh, sorry, the God of patience, Romans 15, verse 5, is one of the divine titles. Deity is thus dominated, denominated. First, because God is both the author and object of the grace of patience in the saint. So we can't be patient in and of ourselves. Absolutely. It's, again, it's another one of those things that we have to patiently, actually, quite funnily, seek God for. I think the thing is as well, sorry, I think we use our language in a, uh, wrongly, and I'd be the first to admit that that would be me. But sometimes we use the word hope. Yeah. So we would say, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. tomorrow. Well, I feel like that patience is, is, is something that we are, like we, we now, we, we're looking forward to that complete day of redemption. And we wait with it with patience and endurance, knowing that it is to come. It's not, patience isn't based upon a false hope. Patience, and I'm talking always from man's perspective now, patience, patience isn't something that, um, let, me, let, me, let me say like this, it goes back to the, the plan of, of salvation, so he that began a good work in you will bring it to completion, so all the while God is, is working it out in you and you in him, so he is displaying his patience in that he bears with us, yet he knows the outcome is, it will come to completion because it's him who is all the while doing it. If that makes sense, it's not. It's not patience with the bad habit or patience with um, something that has no end. But our salvation has been brought. It's been purchased. It's complete. Therefore, because Christ has come and completed all the work that we couldn't do, He therefore can bestow His patience upon us. And then when it says here about patience in the saint, we understand by the scriptures that getting to know God is a progressive lifelong yeah. thing, so the fact is that any of these attributes that we are uh, that we have a part to play in ourselves like patience yeah. Yeah. You know, they it's are yeah. Yeah, they, they are progressive and in that he will, he will teach us his own patience by allowing the things in our lives to cause us to be patient to cause us to be patient because the thing is, we, we, can, we can, so many people pray, don't they? Oh Lord, make me patient. Make me this, make, make me that, make me the other. But make me patient and expect suddenly to be a, a, a changed character all of a sudden. But actually, the reality of the Christian life is that we change and we become more of like Christ because of the trials and the hardships, the temptations, the persecutions. How else are you going to learn uh, mercy? How else are you going to learn patience? Yeah unless he brings you through such times. Yeah. And so in some, in some ways, he's showing us what he is like by, well, by the life he allows us to live. Again, this, this is, we use, I feel at times we use a too broad a paintbrush. You know, why is God patient with us? And it comes back to that, which I've been looking at through Thomas Watson, is because he was childless. And that's why he can, he, can, he can kind of give you, he gives you that patience and grace because you belong to him. You belong to him. And, and I think sometimes we just use the word patience as if, as if God is sitting there hoping that you might come about to a place as if I think about, that, about my own children. That's the point I was trying to get. I patiently hope that my children will come to maturity in a certain thing. God isn't patiently waiting and hoping that his people are going to come to a place. He is... He is he is bestowing his patience towards us because we belong to him. I think the reason being is what you're trying to say is that when we think of the word patience, it always has to do with time. Yeah. So you're kind of saying, if you've been patient, it, it's something that you're waiting for over time. Whereas, you know, there the, 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 the could be the in, in the uncertainty about it. But God, God isn't yeah, waiting over right. a period of time because in that period of time, he hopes that you, that you will choose him. Yeah. Or things like that. Or change, you know. Yeah, or change. You know we, we think, and then just deal with this at the end. Think about those besetting sins that so easily 
what is it entangled yeah. and, and God isn't patiently hoping that we'll change he, he is granting his patience upon us so that we do change yeah. it's not a hope that we'll change he is graciously working it out in his own way and plan that we do change isn't, there isn't a might about it or uncertainty no, in it. This is, this is no less um, a certain pure essence of God than any other. So he is, his patience is... You can't, you can, there's no way you can say that God is any less patient than he is merciful or any less patient than he is sovereign. Yeah. He's equally essential in all of them. Yeah. This is no flaw in it. Okay, so... The God of patience is one of the divine titles. Deity is thus denominated first because God is both the author and the object of the grace of patience in the saint. Secondly, because this is what he is in himself, patience is one of his perfections. Thirdly, as a pattern for us, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourselves with the compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That's Colossians 3, verse 12. And again, be therefore followers or emulators of God as dear children. Ephesians 5, verse 1. When tempted to be disgusted at the dullness of another, or to be revenged on one who has wronged you, Call to remembrance God's infinite patience and long-suffering with yourself. That is something to take out of this chapter that is vitally important. Because we, we can get in the midst of the way we feel. We can get in the midst of our own wrath and anger and hurt and disgust, as it says here. And we want that vengeance. But we need to be a people who call to remembrance just what God has been for us. You know, it's like that, that parable again, or particularly where Jesus is in the house of Simon the leper, and the woman comes and breaks the alabaster box over him, and weeps and wipes his feet with her hair, and this Simon the Pharisee, he asks him, you know, one owes me 50 denarii, the other owes me 500, and he forgives them both, who will love him more? The one who is forgiven more. And so in a sense it says here that those who have wronged us and we call to remembrance God's infinite patience and long suffering we've, we've got to look at those who have wronged us that owe us if you like but then we've got to make sure that we're looking about just how much that we should have paid God and how much we've wronged him. We must, we must, we must pray that God will make us into this kind of people that bring to remembrance these kind of things. Yeah. The patience of God is manifested in his dealings with sinners. How strikingly was it displayed toward the anti-diluvians. When mankind was universally degenerate and all flesh had corrupted its way, God did not destroy them until he had forewarned them. Mm. 1 Peter 3.20 says he waited. Probably no less than 120 years, Genesis 6.3 during which time Noah was a preacher of righteousness, 2 Peter 2.5. So later, when the Gentiles not only worshipped and served the creature more than the creator, but also committed the vilest abominations contrary even to the dictates of nature, we read in Romans 1.19-26, and thereby filled up the measure of their iniquity, Yet instead of drawing his sword for the extermination of such rebels, God allowed all nations to walk in their own ways yeah. and gave them rain from heaven and fruitful seasons. That's Acts 14, 16 and 17. Marvellously was God's patience exercised and manifested toward Israel. You read that, you know, when you read yeah. your daily readings and you, you go through systematically and you see just how obstinate and stiff-necked these people were. And the truth is that we're not any different, really, as a people. But his patience with them 
It says first he endured their conduct for 40 years in the wilderness, Acts 13, 18. Later, when they had entered Canaan, but followed the evil customs of the nations around them and turned to idolatry. Though God had chastened them sorely, he did not utterly destroy them, but in their distress raised up deliverers for them. When their iniquity was raised to such a height that none but a God of infinite patience could have borne them, he spared them many years before he allowed them to be carried down into Babylon. Finally, when their rebellion against him reached its climax by crucifying his son, he waited 40 years mm. before he sent the Romans against them, and that only after they had judged themselves unworthy of everlasting life, Acts 13, 46. There's going to be no one who can stand before God and say, say this is unfair. You know, I just when, when I read that, I don't think I noticed that as I've read through this a few times in, in preparation for tonight. How, you know, there, there's Noah building his ark, preaching his righteousness for 120 years. To biblical terms, that's three generations. He waited before he sent judgment. That is, that is <clears throat> patience. You know, I, you know, I speak for myself and, uh, you know, sometimes, as you've said, we, we so often want to, even in, in, in parenting, in pastoral care, in managing, whatever it might be, we want to bestow judgment there and there. Or we want to... We want to be quick to deal with something where God is, as the scriptures tell us, slow to anger, yeah. slow to anger, you know? What a, what a, I mean, it's an amazing, amazing attribute, really, when you think about it. We could learn so much from it. Sarah's just said, mm. what a helpful discussion. Now we wait patiently for what we have a certain hope of, a better, a heavenly country. Brilliant. God waits patiently as he works in us, forming Christ in us. Nothing unholy will enter heaven. That's a great point, an excellent point. Santos has just put James 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore. Let me just press them more. Oops. Be patient, therefore. Brothers. Brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rain. See, that's another yeah, great point. Yeah. The point here is that that farmer really because he knows what he's doing, because he knows the land, because he knows the rain, because he knows the seed, he knows he's going to get a harvest, and yet, so there's a certainty. That's what I think we've got to labour tonight. Yeah, and then, and, but at the same time, he, he waits patiently because he knows that there is a time that that has got to develop, and that's what Sarah's just said. I suppose, you know, I'm challenged by, by this, actually. I thought this attribute was going to be easy to deal with, but it's not. Um, you know, think about what Darren was speaking about, about a few weeks ago regarding the preaching of the gospel. Um, it will do its work and how impatient we can be with God yeah. and, I, and I do Results. speak for myself to yeah. say you know, I, you know the, he, the, the gospel will do what it has been sent to do yeah. so and, if it, if it's, and God is patient I can't explain God's patience and I, and I don't in one sense want to try to but he has given the wonderful uh, gift of preaching the gospel and in his patience, it's like the winnowing fork, it comes in, it throws up the wheat on the threshing floor, um, the wind comes, which is the Spirit of God, it blows away the chaff, and, and the wheat falls to the floor. That's the work of the gospel. And we ought to pray as ministers of the gospel to seek to be patient, as God is patient, in his design of saving sinners. Yeah. So when we, when we preach, whether it be from the pulpit or the open air, yeah. And it can seem like it's done nothing. Yes. The reality is, it's actually done exactly what God intended it to do. Yeah. Whether that means we're seeing anything at that point, whether that means we'll see anything later. The point is that we have this idea, don't we, that even, to, even though we know nothing, no power in us to change anything, we still act as though there is. Oh, yeah. Like, sure. like we've done something wrong, or the message wasn't right, or people are just hard hearted, which may be the case. Yeah. But the fact is sure. that the gospel will always do its work. And I think, you know, if you mix up the two comments and, or put together what Sarah and, and, and Santos Sometimes has just said, yeah. Sarah speaks of um, as uh, waiting, God waits patiently as he works in us, forming Christ in us. And then what Santos has said about the, the, the harvest. So in a sense, really, we are that harvest in that field. 
what yeah. the bit that Santos has yeah, put, yeah. how there is a certainty, but there's also that time where that harvest is growing and it, that, the harvest will grow and it will be a crop and then there'll be fruit that grows, but there's a period of time that that waits, which is that which Sarah's talking <coughs> about, Christ forming in us until we enter heaven. Uh, it's really good. We're two really good points there, so thanks for that. Yeah, it's good. Okay, I'll carry on. It says, uh, how wondrous is God's patience with the world today? This is written in the, I believe, uh, early 1900s. So we're talking over a century ago, and yet this is so applicable to now. How wondrous is God's patience with the world today. On every side, people are sinning with a high hand. The divine law is trampled underfoot, and God himself openly despised, even more so today. Yeah. It is truly amazing that he does not instantly strike dead those who so brazenly defy him. Why does he not suddenly cut off the haughty infidel and blatant blasphemer, as he did Ananias and Sapphira? Why does he not cause the earth to open up its mouth and devour the persecutors of his people, so that like Dathan and Abiram they shall go down alive into the bottomless pit? And what of apostate Christendom? where every possible form of sin is now tolerated and practised under cover of the holy name of Christ. Why does not the righteous wrath of heaven make an end of such abominations? Only one answer is possible. Because God bears with much patience the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. In some senses we say, why does he? What's the purpose? What's the point of it? We don't need to know. We only need to know that God's will is done and he does according to his own counsel and will. And whatever he does is good, is right, is holy and is for the good, for the good purpose of his people and his own counsel. But I mean when you read that, mm. to, that, is a, that, that paragraph there is an absolute, utter description of the day we're living. Yeah. What of the writer and the reader is a challenge. So what about the writer of this book? What about us now who are reading it? Let us review our own lives. It is not long since we followed a multitude to do evil, have no concern for God's glory, and lived only to gratify self. How patiently he bore with our vile comfort, uh, conduct, sorry, our vile conduct. And now, that grace has snatched us as brands from the burning, giving us a place in God's family, and has begotten us unto an eternal inheritance in glory. How miserably we requite him! How shallow our gratitude! How tardy our obedience! How frequently our backsliding! One reason why God allows the flesh to remain in the believer is that he may exhibit his patience to us. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. Since this divine attribute is manifested only in this world, God takes advantage to display it towards his own, which is what we were talking about early, earlier. He takes advantage of it to display it toward his own people. And you know that, again, that last paragraph, something, again, we must really take to heart when we look at others and judge. You know, we were once, it was Ephesians, I think, where Paul says, as were once some of us. You know, we were once like this. And you know, after you've been a Christian for a while, you can forget that, can't you? Mm. Forget what we used to be like. And in fact, in some ways, in our minds and our flesh and our hearts still are. And we need to look toward God and actually say, you know, if we'd ask the question, if I was to ask you, and if I was to ask all of you that are watching right now, how miserably... Do, you, do we, do you require God? Yeah. How shallow is our gratitude towards Him? Yeah. How tardy, how slow are we to obey? And how frequent do we backslide? We may not look at ourselves and see we are a, an absolute, complete backsliding person. But do you think that we can have little or I mean, little in the sense of a life, but little backsides, backslidings every day. Mm. How often do we do that? How often do we put ourselves first? 
How often do we, how often are we slow to go and pray? Yeah. Really, we need to, um, I think you said it quite a while ago, Ryan, about we need to look into our own garden and, and cultivate and to dig and to get the weeds out before judging someone else's garden. Yeah. We really do need to make a, a real effort by the power of the Holy Spirit to mortify these things. Okay, so this is the, I think this is the last paragraph. May our meditation upon this divine excellency soften our hearts. Amen. Make our consciences tender. And may we learn in the school of holy experience the patience of saints. Namely, submission to the divine will and continuance in well-doing. Let us earnestly seek grace to emulate this divine excellency. Matthew 5 verse 48 says, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father who is in heaven is perfect. In the immediate context of this verse, Christ exhorts us to love our enemies. Bless those who curse us. Do good to those who hate us. God bears long with the wicked, notwithstanding the multitude of their sins. And shall we desire to be revenged because of a single injury? Mm -hmm. I think that is such a challenge. Such a challenge. I think you said it earlier. The, the reality is we will really know the patience of God when we look in our own life and how slack we can be. Uh, that when we have purposely turned to sin. That when we have not prayed as we ought, not been what we should be, not been as gracious as, as we ought to be, not given himself to the assembling of together as we should, not, not, not giving himself, giving ourselves to the word. Yet God in his patience, long suffering, brings us about, brings us to the place where we would have us. And that for me is about being a child of God and his promises to us. Should we just read this 2 Peter 3 verse 9? It says here in this verse, 2 Peter 3 verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's not slack toward his promise. And, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, again, it's our human weakness to be people who want things right here and now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that is the chapter complete, and I can't believe we've been going for an hour, nearly. Um, and the truth is, um, without doubt, it would be better if we were all together in this room in, in a way that we can discuss this better. Um, and we are looking to, to see those days resume um, but why are we doing this? And I know that Russell said this, and I've said this, and Darren has said this when we've been doing these chapters. Those who have a desire to know God will do these things. You know, it's not just about completing a book and getting through the attributes and ticking them off. But I ask you tonight again, as we finish off, do you want to know Him? Do you long, as Paul says, that I might know Him? And, and, and when we speak as Sarah, as Paul, as as, as, as all, all of you who are watching have put, there's this, this, there's this loveliness and this enjoyment on looking at the patience of God. And I, for sure, tonight come away with more questions than I do answers. Because He is the God of patience. And we cannot and will not fully grasp this. Yet we can, just because we won't fully grasp it, doesn't mean that we ought not to look through the crack in the door. To seek God out and to, to love Him and to worship Him as we as we ought to do. And, and tonight, if this and I am convinced, and let me let me say this, I, I'm convinced tonight here at Jacksdale Salston Community Church that people are getting weary, that people are getting frustrated with this conversation. My concern is that people are not doing the things that they ought to be doing. My concern is that we're not praying like we ought. We have no fixed prayer meeting, we have no real fixed Bible study. This is the best that we can offer. But it is your responsibility, not mine, nor Russell's, to seek God. Because I will stand before God for me 
And you will stand before God for you. Yeah. So in this time of frustration, in this time of weariness, in this time of, of tiredness and not knowing really what, what will come about tomorrow, I encourage you today to give yourself steadfastly, to gathering in these meetings as we have them right now, to keep steadfastly in the Word of God, to keep steadfastly in prayer to the day that we return again and be together. Anybody who keeps quoting to me that the church is not about a building, I think that I, I might scream. Because that's just nonsensical. We're not talking about a building being opened. We're talking about the people of God. Christians once again gathering together for what we've been made. Yeah. Being together. Being together. If we've been made for that. This is not good. I'll tell you, this is too many lone rangers out there sitting and enjoying the television. Or even this platform. Yeah. I want to tell you something. And it comes from us both here tonight. We're doing this is because this is all we have. But sitting behind that screen is not the perfect way to fellowship. And we do not endorse this way of church to continue. So here and after, we need to, by God's help and guidance, we need to seek to pr and ask our God, our Father, who is kind and who is patient, to bring about that time where we can meet again. I'm warning you tonight not to get comfortable in the situation in any way, shape or form. If anyone is comfortable by just turning on Facebook or turning on one of their favourite preachers, they will in, in the end end up in error. Yeah, true. Amen. So um, I want to encourage you, though this has been a great platform, I want to say to you tonight, it is not the best. And as I've heard quoted, it is not awesome. This, we ought to be mourning in this situation. We ought to be longing for the people of God again. To, I long to see the praises of the people. And I long to see the prayers of the saints being lifted once again from this church. And to press on in the things that the Lord has for us. Let me just read this just before we pray and finish. Um, Hebrews 10, 24-25. Vitamin important scripture to... Uh, back up what Ryan's just said. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Can't do that if you're not together. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Understandably, at this moment in time, we can't physically fulfil that command, but we know this is only temporary and we know that that scripture is true for us and that we cannot be a people who after this situation is up that we neglect or forsake the assembly together because we've got comfortable. So there's the scripture for us. Father we commit the situation to you. We first of all thank you for your patience towards us. We thank you that you are slow to anger for if you were quick to anger we would all be like a candle in front of a furnace. But Lord, you have bestowed your grace and your patience and your mercy towards us because of what you have done in your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's all about Christ. It's all what he has purchased. And I pray, Lord, tonight that as your people consider these things that we will not go away, quick to, to dismiss what we've heard and quick to move on and quick to say we now understand it, but quite the opposite, Lord, that we would continue to want to learn, not that we might know big words or, or we might be able to flip the pages of the scripture quicker than we once did, but that we might grow in the knowledge, in the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Father, I ask a blessing upon your people here in this church tonight. Father, of course, throughout the lands, but Lord, I ask tonight for those to whom gather together in this place, that you will draw them to yourself once again. Father, where there is those that are weary, that you will refresh. Where there are those that are uh, uh, growing in, in um, weakness that you'll strengthen. Where there are those who, who may not give a care to where they watch or where they listen or whether they pray or whether they read the word, that you would grant grace to them, that you would give them a heart to desire to want to know you. Lord, we look to you for all things. And Lord, I pray that this attribute, the patience of God, that we too would look to be followers of you and to then bestow our, that patience that you have given us onto those around us. Father, I pray in these strange, strange days, in, this, in the days where wickedness 
and turmoil and tragedy is ever around us. Surrounded by it we are, Lord, in these days, that you will grant us grace. Lord, you grant us strength. And of course, that you will grant us patience. That we might live another day to praise your holy name.